Welcome to the Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. Just before the start of the holiday season, I fell and fractured my shoulder. At the point of this recording, the worst of the pain has subsided and I'm slowly figuring out what I can do with one arm. Turns out, a lot. My sewing studio was a mess because I was in the middle of preparations for this part of my piecing video series with partially constructed pieces covering all the surfaces. My primary goal, once I got the pain and discomfort stabilized, was to see through this part <laughs> so that I could clean the place up. So with one functioning arm and a couple of working fingers, I'm valiantly carrying on. At this point, we have all of our piecing completed. We have everything fused to the appropriate backing. I'm creating a mat and a tote using Peltex 71, which is a one-sided fusible. I'm piecing a summer dress, A-line, with sleeves, and it will have pockets. I fused all the pieces to a backing of fusing it. We talked about backing materials in a previous episode. So all that's left to do is cover all of the budded pieces with something decorative. A rule of thumb I live by is that any trim of any kind stitched onto a garment should be biased. Of course, I break my rules all the time. This vest is trimmed with inkle woven bands. They are most certainly not bias, but the fabric and fur lining can handle a non-flexible trim. This vest is trimmed with fur. Again, the fabric and fur lining can handle the lack of flex. These two garments are trimmed with ultra suede. Ultra suede does have a slight give to it, but those are exceptions. Mostly, I use bias tubes. This coat has bias tubes from some silk and some poly. This vest is trimmed with bias wool crepe. This vest is trimmed with bias tubes of gold lame. What you choose to make bias strips from is sort of up to you. I love using leftover scraps for this part, as well as old clothing that doesn't work for me anymore. Choose something with body, and preferably something that will take a press. Quilt fabrics are a common choice for the tote or the mat. For this dress, I wanted something more fluid, so I chose a rayon from bamboo. For this vest, I chose the leftover remnants of a dark wool suiting. How dark or light the bias strips should be depends on the look you're going for. In this vest, I wanted a strong graphic outline to tie all the components together. In this dress, I wanted a very soft, watery look, summery, and I didn't want an obvious graphic grid all over my body. So I chose a really light gray-blue color. I had enough hand-woven scraps left over from the dress that I could make a tote as well. Here, I chose something more mid-value. This is raw silk. I welcomed the graphic look of the diagonal grid. Whatever you decide to use for your bias tubes, wash the fabric first. You'll need a pile of bias strips. I cut mine one and a quarter inches or 3.2 centimeters wide. When folded and stitched, this width will net you 3 eighths of an inch or one centimeter bias tubes. I find that width suitable for almost everything I make with this technique. We covered cutting bias strips in a separate video. Please review that if you don't remember how. Though mostly I just need short pieces, occasionally 
as in the case of the dress, I might have to piece the bias to get a long enough tube. Make sure to watch the part about joining bias strips as well. On smaller projects, I like to just cut and make a bunch of tubes and wing it. When I might not have enough fabric, or might not have a long enough piece, or I don't want to cut too much, I plan more carefully, like I did here for this tote. And on the dress, I definitely had to piece by a strips for the longer lengths. So how do we convert these strips into usable tubes? We use a press bar, of course. Many quilters supply places sell sets of press bars. This set from So Easy, purchased through Amazon, is made from metal. There are four sizes, one of which is three-eighths of an inch or one centimeter. Clover makes a set of press bars made from a heat-resistant plastic, and these have a loopy thing at the end so you can pull stuffing through the tube and make puffy trim. The Clover set has a 5 sixteenths of an inch or 9 millimeter bar. This works just fine. My favorite press bar is from the hardware store. It is also 5 sixteenths of an inch or 8.8 millimeters. This is a cable or zip tie on steroids. It's commonly called a duct tie since it's used to hold insulation around duct work. At least I think that's what they do with it in the construction world. I use them all over my weaving studio for all kinds of purposes. They too are heat resistant and they can come in really long lengths, though any length press bar will work. The only disadvantage to these is you can't just buy one. Perhaps you can share with a friend or the entire guild. So let's make some bias tubes. First, fold one of your bias strips in half lengthwise, wrong sides together. Do not press yet. From the folded edge, stitch a 3 8 inch or one centimeter seam from the folded edge. Insert whichever press bar you have that is 5 sixteenths of an inch to 3 eighths of an inch or 8.8 .8 millimeters to one centimeter. Slowly rotate the seam so it just clears the top side of the press bar. The remaining seam allowances center over the top of the bar, creating a bit of padding. Carefully steam press the top of the press bar. Assuming your tube is longer than the press bar, slide the bar up the tube, repeating the process until the entire tube is pressed. Slip the press bar out of the tube and turn the tube over so the seam allowances are underneath and give the tube a final pressing. Next time, in part four, we will explore where and how to attach these cool little bias tubes. I'm Daryl Lancaster for The Weaver Sews.